So again we're going to go on to plants, which is no different from the soil in that it's all part of the whole. But just for purposes of learning and trying to explain what we're looking at. And I've already said to quite a few of you, just hang on, we're going to be doing that later. Because the way we as humans think, if we mix it all up and try and explain it as such, we won't get an idea of what I'm trying to tell you. So we split it up into soil, we're going to talk about plants, we're going to talk about animal performance, but all of it is directly related to the whole. So we look at plants, and I could never have done it without holistic management. So again, we, if we can get to the right place, through holistic management and the decision-making process, it enables us to take this complex, multi-dimensional thing called the environment and put it in a linear format for us to make a decision and come to some sort of conclusion. And of course, we've got that three-part goal. The quality of life forms the production and future resource base. We define the whole under management so we understand what we worth, what we are able to do. We then have the ecosystem processes, the water cycle, the mineral cycle, energy flow and community dynamics, which is the filter to the decision to make sure that every decision that we make is environmentally sound. And again we have the tools because no human can do anything to the soil without the tool. And the two new tools are animal impact and grazing, which we've spoken a bit about and we'll go into it in more depth. We then have the planning procedures. I beg your pardon. We then have the testing guidelines, the seven testing guidelines. And where it fails the testing guidelines is where we should monitor to make sure that the decision we're making achieves the outcome we want. So that is done with monitoring. And again, it's all important to make sure that the decision or the, the result of the decision that you've made is not a total failure. And we do that by nudging it. And it's a bit like at least I can talk to you guys because you understand cricket. After the first team has gone in and made so many runs, however far the second team goes from where the first team was, the more difficult it is to catch up and get there. So we monitor it all the way and we keep it as close as possible to where we want to get the end result. It's as simple as that. The planning procedures are the four planning procedures. Financial planning, biological monitoring, grazing planning, and land planning. And it simplifies things to enable you to manage the whole more effectively and then we monitor and we make a decision leading towards a holistic goal. So we look at how grass grows. So there, <coughs> okay, obviously grass is growing there, there's your grass plant. We've got bulk on the vertical axis, we've got time on the horizontal axis. To grow that height, when you at that height, at that shortest, so early in the spring, it takes the same time as to grow that height later. So why graze it here if you can wait there or even there? But you don't want it to lose its vegetative status. So if we put it into volume, that's what it looks like. So here at 10 days, spring pasture growth since last graze in kgs per hectare, 698. If we wait another 10 days, 290. But look what happens if we wait 30 days. And that is a trick to get your soil, so we go back here, to get your soil in a condition that the plant is not stressed because stressed plants tend to go to seed, go to flower 
and we graze accordingly. Any questions on that? Any disagreements on that? So we make sure we've got the volume because part of the volume is what's harvesting the sunlight and turning it into sugars, carbohydrates. And obviously the longer, as I pointed out with that pivot in Utah, in America, where the soil had been fixed, the plants had got to waist high and were still not flowering. And that's what we need. So we go into the pasture and we watch a cow. And you all know this. She grazes, she grazes. Now she's grazed that. And in my reckoning, why doesn't she graze that? It didn't smell right. Sorry? It didn't smell right. No. It hasn't got the same energy. Now, I told a few of you, they did it in South Africa where in a hundred cows they took five cows and they nuked them. They cut the taste, they cut the smell, they cut the sight, they cut the hearing, and they nuked the cows. Because... Conventional nutritionists said cattle will only eat what tastes good. So after they nuked the cattle, they put them together and fed them free choice mineral and watched them. The new cattle ate exactly the same minerals as the unnuked cattle. So what caused that they could identify that mineral? Feedback. Sorry? Feedback from the gut. No. Because you had this feed trough with 20 minerals, and like the cows that weren't new, they walked up, they lifted the flap, they took the mineral, and they walked away. The new ones did exactly the same. They walked to the trough, they lifted the flap, they took the mineral, and they walked away. So it's not habit. Energy field. Can I add, um, what you're saying is so true, true look, from my own observations. That's, uh, there's a symbiosis going on between ruminants, soil, and pasture, so much so that when they come in sync, I watched my cows move across the paddock and graze even, but not eat everything. So they'll take a mouthful and drop it, or move it and drop it, they'll take a mouthful and swallow it. So they go across the field, and by the time they get to the other side, it's a zippy mode. And they'll do that, especially in the spring. So, <clears throat> we'll see some slides later on. In your book, what is clover? In terms of energy, protein, or whatever. Basically, if you analyze a clover plant, it is predominantly protein. Okay? So in early spring, I watched this herd and they went in. It was a clover grass pasture. They ate all the clover and never touched the grass. Because in early spring, clover has more energy in its leaf than grass. An animal will fill up on energy first and then concentrate on protein to balance, get pH 7. So yes, your density has to be such, when an animal walks across a pasture, it leaves a smell three times the width of an animal on the pasture. Three times the width. When a dog jumps out of your pickup and looks for you, he finds you easy because he hardly puts his nose to the ground because we've left a trail three times our width for the dog to follow. And it's exactly with a cow. And yet no cow will eat on its own smell. So if you've got a nice big pasture and you sit with a traditional herd of 60 cows and you let it out in the pasture, what do the cattle do? They normally walk the boundary to find out where the limits are. And they come back and then they might do a bit of grazing and they fiddle around 
but they're not really sure what they want to do. They've already lost 30% of the grazing available in that paddock because it sticks. No mammal eats on its own species. So you write, if your stocking rate is right, they'll go across the paddock, they'll take this and that, but actually as they gain, the majority in the first move will be energy, and the second one will be protein. And you can watch it with pH paper. So in the morning, you take the pH of the cattle, and it'll be down here in 6 and lower, and you come back in the afternoon and it's spot on 7 or 7.5. So what we spoke about earlier where you can graze one paddock in the morning and another one in the afternoon and balance the diets to get the animals to eat various grasses that you're having difficulty with. Just plan it, manage it and move accordingly. But manage it with time. Any questions on that? So I reckon, gee, I'm going all the way back here, I'm obviously getting excited. Okay. So, I reckon that wild animals, or even cattle, but cattle don't jump fences, these are wild animals. From 20 kilometers away, I've got a net inflow of wild animals. The energy on my property, because of the way I manage, is higher in the, my grasses than my neighbor. And the beauty of it is, they eat the, they eat the neighbor's grasses, grow there, and I shoot the hell out of them and sell them meat on my property. <laughs> That's what I call true profit. <laughs> and this is just an observation, guys. But what is science? Science is an observation of a certain situation. And that's what's happening at home. So we watch this cow, and there she is, she's grazed that, but she hasn't grazed that. She picks up her head and goes to the other corner of the paddock and eats a patch of grass there and then moves somewhere else. So watch cattle, because it's interesting, we do better watching the cattle than going to the coffee shop. So watch the cattle. So for the purpose of this example, one herd of animals, 10 paddocks, and the 30 day recovery period. So we go there, and each line there predicts is a paddock. Okay? So there are three paddocks up on the board, and as we go, We've now grazed 10 paddocks. We want them at a density such that we've used the formula size of paddock divided by whole area to be grazed times recovery period. We will graze that and hopefully this is what we'll achieve because now we come from conventional grazing. Our roots are short because we've kept that grass nice and short like they tell us to. To get animal performance, you've got to nail it into the ground and never let it get above two inches of high. And the roots are looking like that. But when we graze it, this is what we achieve. We take the top off the grass. Does anybody disagree with what I'm saying? Because if it creates discussion, it's going to help other people. So we move on. Now that first paddock has had a 30-day recovery period. So again, and of course, I beg your pardon, there's a dieback in the roots because you've taken the top off. So the roots contract and leave carbon in the soil. The fine capillaries is carbon and it's left in the soil. So we go to the next graze and that's what happens. But notice I put them closer together, the lines. So there are 10 lines there. But there are another 10 lines there, and there are another deeper roots, because you have now grown double the amount of food that you originally had. If you go to a rose plant in the garden here, and you take your second tears and you clip the plant, what happens? It pushes up. And it's exactly the same. Not dry grass. I'm not talking about dry grass. I'm talking about proper grass. <laughs> it will increase in volume if the top is clipped. Not only that, the roots go deeper because it hasn't had cattle in there perpetually grazing it and losing the depth. So again we graze it, 
and we clip off the top there, and again there's a die back in the roots. So now we only get to the third grazing, but look what's happening. We've now got three times the grass in the same paddock. So you remember I've told you take the best 50% of your property. Put all your animals on the 50% and in the third graze, doing it correctly, you've got more than enough food than you had on your home, whole property doing it the way you used to do it. Okay? Anybody disagree? So we graze it and again we take off the top and we take off the bottom. But what have we done here? We've left stockpile for the non-growing season. So we go even further because what is actually happening? We are treading carbon litter on the ground. What does carbon do? What does litter do? It covers the soil. It feeds life on the soil surface. It feeds the zoobacter, which are taking nitrogen from the air and fixing it in the soil. It keeps the soil at a constant temperature irrespective of heat or cold. Okay, that's what it looks like. So each time we're putting down more litter, we're feeding the soil, we are changing the soil profile at no cost. The earthworms are working. That's what's happening. We've got carbon building up on the surface, we've got carbon building up below the surface. All of a sudden we have no droughts anymore, even in Africa, because that stores moisture and the plants grow and we increase our stocking rate by at least double, probably four times. I've seen six times and I don't know where the end is. Does anybody disagree with what I'm saying? Does anybody not understand what I'm saying? We've, um, on, on, we've got a block and several different pieces, but our hill block in particular, we've been going around and nipping it off. They're only nipping off the best third of the plants and leave everything out. Are you able to get anything trodden there? No. That is the problem. You see this? This is the secret to, to get the densities high enough to get the trick. Yeah. And nobody has got enough cattle to deal with their whole property. And that's why I say, please take all your animals and use half your property. And it goes back to that scenario of me saying that when I started doing it, I lost animal condition because I was like a fox terrier just pissing on the corner post. That's what I was doing. Because in, in between, I'd grown this huge amount of grass. And guys in Africa, our grass grows. I mean, it's as high as that door. That's how high it grows. But when we can tread it on the ground, there's an explosion with what changes. So what, what happens when you get this high growth and then you're going into winter and then your levels are getting lower and lower? Because quite often what happens is it goes all sad in the spring and won't grow, early spring, we find it. So small. what we do here, we call this stockpile and we go in and we manage it with time. So if we've got a winter or a non-growing season of 180 days, you would use your recovery period as 90 days because you want to graze your stockpile to a reasonable height for the new grass to come through. Okay? So it's size of paddock divided by the whole area to be grazed, times 90, and you will eat that amount, and figuratively, it's the top portion that's going to be grazed first. The animal will sort, source the best grass, and the second graze will be there, but still leave enough brown to cover the soil, and when the green starts coming through from the spring, it'll be green with the brown, and you won't get a protein excess. Those animals that can put on weight early in the spring, as I've said before, are going to be your best animals the whole season. What if you've got, uh, we've got a couple of paddocks where we've got cover, cover, cover crops in, and 
some of the crops, some of the covers that animals don't like. There was a lupin and there's some kales that have gone to flower. Lupin they won't eat because they're excess protein. Mm -hmm. Right, well they've left all those, you know, they were in the seed mix. And now then you've got, in, in the spring you've got all that new grass coming through so you've got the cows in again, the cattle in again. But they still haven't touched the... Your densities aren't high enough. Yeah, probably not. We've got them in little tight areas. No, don't say probably. Pardon? Don't say probably. We have. We've got they are not high enough, probably. Yeah. And I want, please, I'm not being critical because it goes back to quality of life. What do you want to do? But I'm sure in the summertime I can go and put a caravan in my paddock and get a student and tell him to bring whoever he wants to bring and supply them with meat and whatever he can barbecue every day and all day. As long as he moves the cattle every half hour. So what do we do with those, those, um, yeah, what do we do with those, Sorry, what do you do with? So what do we do with those plants so that it continually... You go in there with a the mower and you bush hog it nine inches high okay. to let the light get in for your new plants which are coming through fast and furious from below. Mm -hmm. The cattle or the sheep when they get there will eat the brown which has now been cut off and is cured as lying hay on the top, helps with your litter. Mm -hmm. And I'll eat the green underneath and I'll have a perfectly balanced diet. Any other question on this side? The, the length and the maturity of pasture dictates how easy it is to lay pasture down. Say that again. Um, the longer the pasture and the more mature it is, it's easier to get the animals to lay it down. Yeah, the easier it is, but again, I would rather you lose, rather than lose performance on the animals trying to get your high density, I'd rather you came in with a mower, a slasher mower, and just mow it down and put it on the ground as litter. Because that is gold, people. That is part of your fertility. That will change the profile in your soil. It will feed the biota, and you will, over a period of 18 months to two years, need no fertilizer. None. So instead of mowers, uh, crop is an option, or when the crop gets more mature? What do you mean a crimper mower, something that... Oh, that a crimper robber. Like well, yeah, it can do. I'm a bit worried about what the crimper is because I don't want compaction. Yeah, no, no what they're used for, laying down cover crops and the stakes and everything. Okay. But their crops got to be reasonably mature, otherwise they'll just spring up. Yeah, well that you need to try. I, I haven't had any experience in that. I don't like spotting and tracking. Yeah. Um, so I can see your, your dieback that you're talking about here, you know, where you, you chew off the top and you get the dieback. The, the only trouble is with, with the, what you're talking about, um, the difference between trampling and mowing, is, is that if you come in and mow it, then aren't you going to get whole, you know, I mean, if you mow it down to say 1,400 kilos of dry matter across the paddock, um, when in fact it was, might have been 4,500 and you, you know, you want to put that on the ground, aren't you going to get um, significant dieback because you've chewed it off effectively? So your dieback only comes when you mow, particularly a mower, a sickle bar mower, where it all lies in the same direction. Yeah. That's when you're going to get a mow back, dieback. So in effect, what you should do is mow and then bring the cattle in behind to mix it up. Yeah. Because NRCS people in America keep saying to me, too much litter kills grass. It only kills grass when you've used mechanical methods, natural methods. Animals tend to stir it all up. Yeah. But getting that carbon that organic matter on the soil for the earthworms to start working on it the next growing season is going to be phenomenal, people. In our soil, then, it's even very difficult to get litter on the ground because of that climate and how wet it is and, and the biology that's there already. And they say you can't really get litter. Well, your biology is not there too much because you guys have used fertilizers and you use Roundup and you've had cover crops and you've done everything. 
Everything that you shouldn't do, you've done your best to kill your Lord, yourself, and you've done it. So just try. But it does help. Okay. Good. So we calculate number of days stay in a paddock. I've used two examples here. When you start out, you're on the left-hand side, and I put it straight. You don't know the yield of those paddocks. In other words, you don't know how many tons of food is coming off paddock number one relative to paddock number five. So you rate them all the same, and you use this calculation. Size of paddock, times recovery period, divided by whole area to be grazed, will give you days stay in that paddock. Now people don't work with portion of days unless it's a half day and you're moving in half days. Don't worry about it, just round it off. You're dealing with chaos, just create a bit more chaos. <laughs> it doesn't matter, just have fun with it. But on the right hand side, we've been at this long enough to know that our best paddock is one. <coughs> Okay, so the area of the paddock times one is our best paddock. Our next best paddock is the area of the paddock times 0.8. So it's yielding 0.8 of one. So you're reducing the area that you are grazing and the actual day stay in the paddock will be different. So size of paddock times rating, whether it's one, 0.8, 0.5, 0 0.2 times recovery period will be divided by the whole area to be grazed will give you the day's stay in that paddock because you want food to be even over the whole property that you are utilizing. You don't want one paddock grazed more than another paddock because it just makes your whole management too complicated. You want to simplify the whole thing. Any questions? When you do this, how many sort of ratings do you land up with? I mean, you say like the next big pellet, you, you, you would go say 0.8, but you know, if you've got 50 pellets, you're obviously not going to go at 50 different ratings. You're no, no, gonna, no, no. probably three. Yeah. But what it does is it leaves more of the same over the whole property that you're utilizing. That's all. <laughs> Guys, I've got more clients taking fences out than putting fences in. Be careful of putting two smaller paddocks in. Temporary electric fencing, fine. Please do not put permanent. Does everybody understand what we're talking about here? Does everybody understand the principles here? I think so. Yeah. I don't understand them. Yeah. No, I don't understand them. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the, paddock, the paddock's two hectares, okay, and, and the recovery period is 30 days. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, that's 60. So now what the whole area is to be grazed, what is that the size of the whole farm? No, well I've just told you, you're only using half your farm, so maybe it's the area of half your farm. Whatever you decide. That's why I've got to say the whole area to be grazed. Because you've now allocated that area to be grazed by whatever herd you've got. Okay, so if, if you've got two herds, I suggest you do two cells to simplify the maths. So, um, I'll, um, can we just, I'll go back from a 60, so now what do I do with the whole area to be grazed? Do I divide it or multiply it or what? what? No, so it's the size of paddock. Okay. No, I'm on the left. On the the moment. Moment. You're on the left, yeah, okay. Size of paddock. Yeah, it's two okay, hectares. Okay, so the paddock we're going into graze how many? Two one, hectares. How many acres? Two, oh, um, uh, five acres. Five hectares. Five acres. Five acres. Five acres. <laughs> Five acres. Okay, we we're working acres. Oh. I forgot I'm back in New Zealand. Two Rod hectares. Three <laughs> hectares. <laughs> okay, we've got, we got three hectares <laughs> times 30. Three hectares. <laughs> two hectares. Two hectares. Yeah. Two hectares times 30. Yeah. Okay, how much have you set aside to graze? Uh, 50. Uh, okay. <laughs> Divided by 50. Alright. Will give you that answer. How many days? And it will be yeah. one or two point something. Right. Just round it off. Okay. One day. Gotcha. Don't be a mathematician. Just simplify. Okay. 
create more cows? <laughs> <laughs> so it's one day, one day. So it's one day. You move it. So, so you just move it after a day. After a day. So you don't have to move them every 20 minutes or half an hour. If you have had an argument, you can move it every day. <laughs> 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 Whatever. I don't care. <laughs> so ideally, the shorter the time, the better. You don't want to go over three days. No, don't look at the ground and say, I've got another day's grazing here, because immediately you'll have to start losing an animal performance. No, 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 no,
safety paddocks to give them, that, so they don't come back into that first paddock until you have the 30-day rotation. Correct. Right. So not the whole reserve, but no. a portion of the portion reserve. Yeah. So you gradually work it in. So what have you done now? You've created flexibility in your plan. Because you have, let's say, 20 paddocks, or to keep it simple, you've got 10 paddocks that you are working with. You've got another 10 paddocks that are around the outside that you're not working with because you are doing such a good job. The minute the weather changes, you just go in and take a few more paddocks that are convenient to move from the ones that you're using and just get a few more days because you don't want to get less than 30 days. In fact, in a dry period, you might not to move that 30 to 45 days because it hasn't rained for two weeks, which is a drought in New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what I recommend this grazing plan is first class because it's simple and it clearly will illustrate to the operator whether the stocking rate can be increased and what his carrying capacity is likely to be going forward at the same time as growing this carrying capacity. So not only are you finding out, you're also improving. Thank you, David. Yeah. I think you better come up here and speak New Zealand. I don't understand. <laughs> My problem is I'm speaking this, South African. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very good plan for anybody starting into this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Something I'd like to ask you, you we keep talking about a 30 day rotation. How do you determine what your rotation no, should be? No, we're getting there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you guys are in a hurry now. <laughs> you want me out of here by tonight. <laughs> <laughs> now, this also assumes that you are currently stocked with your current uh, method of grazing, uh, stocked to a, a system that's working for you at the moment, and yeah. all you're doing is improving on that. And so, you are an average New Zealander, you're yeah. not the best. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm. So, your average stocking rate for New Zealand, uh, and it's recognized by the government, and you're within the law. The problem is in New Zealand they start then shouting at you when you get to six times the stocking rate. <laughs> because they drive down the road and they say, oh, he's abusing his cows. <laughs> but I'm in Africa, I couldn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so you run into trouble before then you should have run through overseer, yeah. the environment modeling thing, and they say... Yeah. But on the know. other hand, you don't go to that guy's business and tell him his toilets are dirty. Exactly. Why must he do it to you? But anyway, I don't want to get into politics. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, whoa, whoa. Let's go. Right. Does everybody understand this one? Yes. Yes. Guys, don't complicate it. I promise you, the minute you start complicating it, you're going to make mistakes. Just keep it simple. Create more chaos. It doesn't matter. It is already chaos. And just get on with it. And you will fine tune it for your property, relating back to your quality of life. Good? <coughs> so, we go to the Chihuahua Desert, and these bulls are for the follows function, and they haven't had new genetic material for 87 years. And look what they're grazing. Those cattle have never been fed a supplement, either minerals or salt or anything. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you are lightly stocked, you do not need salt, you do not need minerals, you do not need anything other than grazing. But the minute you start increasing your stocking rate, you better start thinking about helping the environment, and that is giving minerals and salt. So don't write on the internet and say, what a wonderful farmer I am. I don't need to give anything. You only don't need to give anything because you're making money elsewhere and you don't have to make money off your farm. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And Americans are exceptionally good at that. <laughs> So we go to Arkansas and that's what the paddock looked like. So there is dead soil. It's got no oxygen in the soil. It's growing all these yellow flowers. 
the guy bought this ranch to shoot duck. Okay, got lots of water on it, to shoot duck. After five years of not shooting many duck, he decided he needed to make some money out of it. So he got me in and he wanted to put cattle on it. Well, this is what he had. These were rice fields, highly fertilized, highly sprayed, and whatever. So that's what it looked like. And I've been talking about carbon. So when I left him, I said this winter, don't use your sacrifice paddock. I want you to get your bales. And the guy living in that house there went to a church where a lot of the neighbors went to the same church. And he said to them, I will mow your yards. Now their yards might be up to 50 acres to keep them clean. And Americans are obsessed with neat and tidy. As long as I can take the bales away. And they said, thank you. He brought in 2,000 bales. Didn't cost him anything except for bailing. He brought it onto the property and he did what I said he must do to feed the cattle. So this was the summer. In the next winter, he rolled them out and this is where he rolled the bales, people. Six months later, that's what it looked like. No seed, no fertilizer, no nothing except bales were fed, cattle were on there. And to give you a better understanding, where there was carbon, look what happened. Where there wasn't carbon, look what hasn't happened. Just by putting carbon down. So what, what sort of bales were there? Is this hay or is this baleage or? No, just rubbish. Rubbish, rubbish off his okay. neighbors. And it wasn't necessarily cut at its best stage. He couldn't do them all at once. You can imagine 50 acres here, 50 acres there, there, all over the place. But he brought on 2,000 bells. He has rehabilitated that whole ranch. But the problem is they now need four times the number of cattle in that one. Trouble. So look at it. Look where, look, look where it didn't get crops. That is how simple it is. Don't complicate the issue. It's not fertilizer that you need. It's not seed that you need. Look at it. So this guy had veg. And unfortunately, I think he was so proud of it, he wanted to show me, and he should have grazed it three times before I saw it. <laughs> so he had lost. You see, this has gone yellow. It wasn't capturing energy anymore. But that soil, a year later, was magnificent. Absolutely magnificent. So we look at these cattle. Now this is early spring. And so you look at the pasture. It's a clover grass pasture. And again we go and we watch what they're eating. And look at it. It's eating, it's eating clover. Okay, that's what the pasture looked like. And in two hours' time, that's what it looked like. Watch the animal. Don't go to the textbook. Don't go to the academics. Watch the cattle. It will cost you less, too. Same guy. That up to the chest, legumes, and look at the thin cattle. Same farm, same cattle. This is in the middle of summer. That is early, early spring. Look at the difference in condition. Because he's grazing in a vegetative stage. And the same guy, stockpile, he does what I do in that diagram for his cattle. He says, he says no, I've got to have sun bales because we freeze here. Okay, it goes frozen or whatever. So he only buys the best now because he's starting to pay tax. So he buys the best bales he can find. And he stores them and it snowed and it iced and two days after it iced he took his bales out and he rolled them out he was still giving his herd stockpile grass with an electric fence he put the bales out the animals smelt the bales and looked at them he moved the stockpile fence the animals moved across to the stockpile 
Eight all the stockpile and came and lay on his beautiful belt. <laughs> Watch the animals. Today he doesn't buy any belt. So everybody says you've got to let plant seed. This guy hasn't let plant seed for seven years. Look at all the seedlings. There always are enough seeds. We do not need any seeds for the next 200 years. There's enough seed there to do whatever we want to do. We just change it with animal impact and changing the fungal bacterial relationship in the soil to grow what we want to grow at no cost. Are there any doubting Thomases still? Here's a duck curly here. Sorry. How's the duck tally now? That he's now that he's changed the surrounding farming area. But is his ponds improved or is this? No, this is different from the, oh, yeah. the duck guy. Oh, yeah. No, he's oh. chuffed now. Now his sons are telling him he's an old guy. He's older than I am, and he's his sons are telling him now, don't sell the farm because we're not making money. Yeah. <laughs> that that clip that you showed with the animals that just went through and picked out all the clover. What do you do with that pig now? Because if you come back in 30 days, that grass is going to be... No, in 30 days, that grass has captured more energy because it's got warmer and it, the cattle will graze the grass and leave the clover. Or we'll only take as much clover for protein and eat the grass for energy. And it's nature's way. Your web pad. When was that? The one up the hill. The new one. And the cows went naked, all the grass and didn't touch clover. That was what's that? So, they, they so all grass and leave the clover. Because the clover has too much protein in it and they didn't need protein. Yeah. Do you feed any protein in the dairy? No. no. Okay, that's surprising they didn't take some. But again, you're, even if they ate the grass, if they didn't take the top third and they took more than the top third, they've got enough protein and nitrates in that to, to satisfy. Interesting. But again, well done, you watch the cattle. And you can plan accordingly as to what you're doing. Shorten, lengthen, recovery periods to accommodate whatever is going on. So we go back to New York State. These are the guys that are selling into New York, meat into New York. These cattle have had no added supplementation. Look at the fat. Same story. They've grown so much grass that this is what happens. They just these cattle are being moved already. They don't know what to do with it. They've grown so much grass. But this is what happens when you graze properly. I took this photograph just to show you. This is where they stored their bales. And look at the clover. Great. So we go back to this guy in Lubbock, Texas. Five years later, and another five years later. People look at the fat cows. He has never seen cattle that fat on his property in his life. He followed me around for four years and eventually I stopped him and I said, he's quite a shy guy. I said, if you've got a problem, do you not understand what I'm talking about? Do you not understand my accent? No, no, no. He says, I understand everything, but I, I don't know how to start. So I said, okay, bring me a map. And he brought the map up. A paddock was 1,200 acres, a paddock. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you're talking about electric fences? He said, I don't know how to do it. So I said, all right, invite me to your property and I'll show you. So the Mexican and I, we put up a temporary electric fence through 1,200 acre paddock. And we, we, had, we had gone, we'd worked for about an hour and a half, two hours. And I turned around to the Mexican guy and I said, where's the boss? He said, no, there he is striking the fence. <laughs> <laughs> and then in this terrain trying to straighten the fence. And I just said, gee, just take the kids, go to the top of the hill and do something else. Please just get away from us. <laughs> the interesting part is he put up three fences in each 1,200 acre paddock to increase his stock density. Three fences. He's taken out two fences, he's left with one fence. Okay? Because his cow herd has now got that big. 
But that one fence is now going in as a permanent fence. So again, we look at the cactus guy. He has just spent 2.3 million US dollars putting watering system for his cattle. That's how confident he knows this is working. They started with a six inch pipe at the top. And it goes through his whole ranch. On both sides, he's got a stream in the middle, a river, and he's put pipelines down the other side. Look at the storage tanks, people. <laughs> and he's got nine of them. Because that's how many cattle he's going to graze on that property. We had to extrapolate how many liters of water we had to store. So if the pumps went down for two days, we had enough, cat enough water for the cattle. It's the equivalent of buying another six ranches. And it's cost them a fraction of six ranches. Marco Barunda, he said his forefathers rode through the Chihuahua Desert and the grass came to the stirrups. And two, three years later, he took his photograph and he said, Thank you. You got a short horse. <laughs> so this is what we try and avoid. Murray bun grass turning grey. We want to get it on the ground. And this is in Namibia. Whoops. Haven't had any rain. Sorry, it's not broken. It's just come out. They each year they have a drought, they destock, and they never stock up. And this is what happens. It goes from this, it's gone totally fungal now, it grows that, and you don't get any grass underneath. And so income and farming income is reduced, and now they're cutting firewood to sell into Cape Town to try and open up the density of the bush. Crazy. And so it goes on. I don't know what we've done here. There you go. And that's what it looks like after they've taken out the excess bush. So the potential is there, but they still don't stock it. So these guys had two ranches like this, and they had just leased a third one. My recommendation was to take all the cattle off all three ranches and put them onto one ranch, lease out the ranch, their second ranch, and drop the lease on the other one that they had. And luckily, I heard only two days ago, they are actually moving in that direction. And you watch, they'll grow grass like you can't believe it, and when their neighbors are having drought, they'll be growing grass. And this is what we do. I'll show you a brittle environment because this is too easy. <laughs> Here you make mistakes and by next week it's healed. Here you must make a mistake in Namibia and you will see that mistake for five years. You only get 10 inches of rain. But they grow good cattle. <coughs> so you're really saying the whole of Central Australia could be a huge production Mm -hmm. area because it's just Australia's separate. got a problem because where those fires have been is going to take more than five years to recover mm -hmm. to get to the potential where they were and that might have been a low potential uh, okay. guys stretch your legs get something to drink do what you need to do right so it is in your hands as to what you grow this is that Amishman, and he phoned me, and he said, I've got a problem. He's got a lot of fescue, and he said, my cattle won't eat the fescue. And he was raising up here, if I point up on the top of the hill here, and I said, well, your dairy's down the bottom. When you bring the cattle down to the dairy, I want you to make a walkabout. So he made a walkabout, and I said, when you have... After the walkabout, after 15 days, I want you to put the cattle in to that paddock and graze it. After 15 days. 
Well, I was there before the 15 days is up. Look what he's grown when he just walked that into the ground. <coughs> Guys, just try something different. If you're moving cattle, just walk them across a paddock, but limit the area that they can walk on so you can monitor what is happening, the change. What is growing here where the cattle walk where there hasn't grown here? It will be different, I promise you. You guys should have enough time to do all these experiments on your own properties because it is all part of the learning curve. Look at that. I mean, when he grazed that, those cattle went in there happy. So the guy in Texas who's just won this wonderful award for so many pounds of beef per acre, he just mowed his rescue when his cattle came out because 90% of it the cattle wouldn't eat. And he was only using probably 12% of his ranch, of his farm. I go and style when I get to Amish. <laughs> but they're not allowed to have photographs taken of them. So I had to get permission. And he can't look at the camera. He's got to look ahead. This ranch had a fire. And two years later, this is what grew. Same ranch, different soil. Same ranch, different soil. What I'm trying to explain to you guys is that I'm not lying about fungal bacterial relationship. There have never been any flowers since. Because fire promotes fungi. Fungi grew flowers. Look at this. Oh, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> it's not bringing any money in the pockets, Brittany. <laughs> So you can manipulate it to achieve what you want to achieve. I think you'll battle to get flowers every year because it's just before it goes to timber. So we look at overgrazed plants and somebody was talking about it and this is on the property in Zimbabwe where they have no fences because of elephant. So the cattle were being put in an enclosure overnight because of predators. And when I arrived there, they had started doing their own thing in holistic management, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then they asked me to come and help. And when I got there, the manager said to me, the problem with these enclosures, where the enclosures were and they have moved on, the grasses that grow there are so palatable that the wild animals of which there were 22 species of wild animals, eat it and of course they live on it because that is the best grass. And so they overgrazed it. And he said it's doing more damage than good. Well, just give it some time because every week those things are moved and you're getting more and more patches of better grass. So now three years down the line, oh no, now things are good. But the problem is, the wild animals are getting the best grass and the beef cattle are eating the rubbish. Because the wild animals go where they need to go at the right time and not when they're told to go. <laughs> so that is running into problems and of course the owners won't shoot or hunt the wild animals. So this is what we're looking at and again, that's what we can manipulate to work on the fungal bacterial relationship and I'm not going to spend any more time on that. To achieve what we want to achieve in terms of this, to grow the plants we want to grow and move forward. So we go to Utah High Desert. This is a good pasture, people. Three, four, five meters between, between grass plants. And they ranch there. But the cattle are pretty good, and this is what the ground looked like because that was the last rain they had a year ago. It is still capped to this day because there's no life. There's no life there. There are no wild animals there. And this is what happens. The plants are dying. There's a little bit of green there, but all this is dead. So you put cattle in, and this is what happens. It disturbs the soil and plants new plants. You must have cattle or sheep 
or livestock to get it to grow. Scenic, beautiful. That herd was 800 head of cattle, cows with their calves, and I bet you their calves weighed more than your calves when they weaned in that desert. Because every blade of grass is just full of energy. So we go to <coughs> the start again. This guy owned a ranch on the Mexican border, South Texas, just off the Gulf Coast, Gulf of Mexico. His family had lived on oil all the three generations. And they're now getting nervous because the price of oil has dropped and he wanted to do something different. He came on a training, he hired a bulldozer and he bulldozed areas to put fence line. The size of his paddocks were two and a half acres per paddock. He bought 680 Corrientes type cattle, which are scrap cattle. He paid a third of the price of any other cattle on the market. He had just lost his wife, so he didn't want to go back to the house. He moved his cattle every hour and a half to two and a half hectares. I beg your pardon, two and a half acres. That's what the cattle looked like, and this is how thick the bush is, people, because there haven't been cattle on that property for at least two generations, so 20, 25 years. No cattle. Just gone to work. <coughs> it used to be open grassland, and the photographs from 150 years ago. So there the cattle are eating trees because there's no grass, people. Okay, they're a bit thin, but he only lost about 12 head. They died, they couldn't get up. But look what they did. Look what they did to the trees because that's the only thing to eat. You see what I talk about cuckoo land? I mean, you guys have got it so easy, you, you, you don't understand it. So that's what it looked like. They go in there and they break the trees. 680 head of cattle and two and a half acres. That's what the grass looked like. That's what it looked like when they moved out. But look at the dung beetles. Immediately that energy that the cattle had put into that ground, there was a different vibe. You could feel it. After the first rain, these are the way places that he cleared with the bulldozer to put the fence lines. After the first rains, he grew broadleaf weeds. We call them weeds. They frosted, lay on the ground, and he had a good spring. Same ground. Same ground. That. You see why I'm not worried? It's yeah. a hiccup? Yeah. Sort it out. Yeah. Look at the density of those grass plants, not broadleaf weeds. And that's in an area that gets very little rain, people. So that, and look at the cattle. This is a ranch that I've been working on two, sorry, about 20 miles down the road from the other one. They used to own the land on the left. The land on the right looked exactly the same. All his cattle in one herd, cows and calves, and look, look what it planted. Look, it looked like that. That guy is doing conventional set stocking, which they do in that part of the world, and this guy high density and graze in this paddock for two days and out. With very little rainfall. Cattle plant grass. Cattle cannot survive without grass. Nature made it so that cattle plant grass. And look at it. Any questions on that? Any doubts? Let's get them out of the way right now. 
time of year is that? Um, they back to front. I know you know, this working in North and South Hemisphere gets me a bit confused. It'd be like May, wouldn't it? Uh, no. That was in Early summer. September. End of the summer. But again, the other benefit I've had, working in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, I learn twice as quickly because I'm summer there and I'm summer here. So I'm learning both things, both sides of the, the equator. This is a plant I grew up on my farm. My forefathers bought it in 1863. I have never seen that plant until I changed my management. It's like a cowpea, a wild cowpea, and it's all over our hills when I changed management and I needed no protein supplementation in the winter time because of that plant. The tree died from cattle, look at it, got borer in because the tree became sick. The fungal bacteria relationship in the soil enabled the borer to get into the tree and the trees now die. It takes time because nature works slowly, but it's cheap and it's effective and it doesn't kill everything else. Mm -hmm. You can see where the borer have got into the tree here. <coughs> and hats off to this guy having told me to zip my lip. I kept it closed for 10 years. He then sent me the picture and said, ha oh, oh, ha at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been through this spraying crazy. But again, guys, the pH, how important this pH is. Anybody want to comment on that as to why or what? Can you change your water to affect the stock's pH? Say it again. Can you have like hard water or limestone water to change no, your stock's the only pH? The problem you need to check in water is anaerobic bacteria which eat iron and sulfur and you can check that by going to a drinking trough putting your hand down the bottom and scraping the side and smelling the sludge if it stinks you've got a problem and really you just watch cattle if cattle come to a drinking trough put their nose in and swallow 72 times your water is perfect if they go there and they lick the water, they blow on it, and they try and drink where the ball valve is, you've got a problem. Don't send it to the laboratory, they'll charge you a fortune and tell you nothing. Because hmm. we, we've got quite a bit of limestone country and the springs come out of limestone hills. That shouldn't be a problem out of limestone. Yeah. So as far as trees and, and pasture go, um, my understanding is case the cattle cattle will browse as well as graze and so to get that relationship with um, uh, trees and pasture essentially they're both needing different amounts of fungi and bacteria but it's a mixture and, and that's quite okay it could that's be good. Yeah. Yeah. patches or whatever yeah. so my great grandfather bought our property because it reminded him of Scotland there was hardly any trees on it it was just open rolling mountains with grass on it Four generations later, all our valleys are totally wooded. And they're totally wooded because those valleys were kept for winter because it's northern hemisphere thinking. You put the cattle where it's protected from the weather for the winter. So they grazed the tops on the summer and they came into the valleys in the winter. And then they had a short winter. First thing they did was take out a matchbox and burn it the next spring. Burning plants trees because burning burns carbon and turns the land fungal and will plant trees. And yet we've still got universities in our country that are promoting bush control with fire. And I'm telling them by burning you planting trees. That's what you believe. But when I had started doing what I do correctly, my neighbor had a microlite and 
And when he flew over, he said, you don't realize from the ground how many trees have now died in your bush because of animal impact. Just changing the fungal bacteria relationship, trees have started to die. And we can get it to open woodland. So people say, well, well now you're leasing out the whole lot of ground again. Doesn't it worry you that they're messing the ground? No. What they've messed up, I can fix in two years. Doesn't matter. So we will lease it out to the person who pays the highest rent because it's part of our solar panel and we're wanting income from our solar panel. Energy is money. Any other comments or questions? You don't want to run all of them? Sorry? You didn't want to run the whole thing? Like the property. 50, yeah, now the problem is that the government, 36 years ago, I got together with 12 ranches and we built a lake, 1,400 hectares in surface area. Our government has nationalized the water. So the only water we own is the water that is surface. So when our son took over a few years ago, they came to him and they said, if you don't use your water for irrigation and grow crops, we're going to confiscate your water rights. Now I've paid over 36 years, paid off the dam, and they're going to take it away from me. So overnight he put up six big pivots to use the water. Now he's got to do cropping and running all the cattle. It's impossible. One person can't do it. So we sold a lot of the cattle. Leased out again two thirds of the property. He's doing the center pivots with cover crops and all the, the big words that you guys use that I don't know. You know. All these cover crop things and difficult things. And gradually building up the cattle again. So we'll get there in 10 years' time. Don't know. <coughs> they might confiscate that then. Sorry? I said they might confiscate that then. Yeah. Good. So we talk about form follows function. These elephants are in Namibia on the west coast. All these grass plants you see here are annuals, otherwise it is bare soil. As you can see that's probably the only tree for miles around. The elephant are small, they're not much bigger than that, as you can see. You go to the east side of South Africa and that's the size of an elephant. But look at the vegetation. Form follows function. Same species, different genotype because they've lived apart and adapted to the environment over the years. They did me. Floor it. That was a New Zealand visitor. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So we went to That sums up the World Cup. We feed them big. We have, happened to have a superb coach and he did well. <laughs> I think England got the front of their lives. Premature. <laughs> right, guys. <coughs> We're going to go questions because I think questions stimulate thought and it's things that pertain to each one of you. Okay, remember I said to you, you plan for what you want, you work with what you have. So you go and find the plants that you have that are in the majority and they're the plants that you work with first. And when your cattle have been in that paddock 
and they've taken that bite off the top here. You put a stake in, and you can use a fencing dropper, and you just put a mark there and the date. Okay? So you've now estimated, or the best way to find out the recovery period for this area is to go to the local pub and go and find the old timers and buy them each seven beers because when they've drunk the seven beers they will give you a figure that you can work with. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, I'm serious. That sounds like a two year. <laughs> <laughs> so, they will give you a figure and you can then work on the figure. And I'm just going to use 30 days. So you say, okay, we'll see what happens and you're going to come back now and you monitor this grass and you go past it and you go and past on your motorbike and this thing has now recovered a little bit. It's grown up here. And again, we come and put a mark. So we put a mark in here and we put the date. So gradually you keep monitoring this plant and you do various species, uh, sorry, various plants of that species all over your property. So you'll come to the point where this is now starting to push up a flower. That is when you stop monitoring and say that is now date so and so, it's pushing up a flower, it's losing its vegetative status. So it's not 30 days, it's 35 days recovery period and others might be 34, 33, 32, you take the average and you work with the average for that plant. So you then look at the next species in the majority of your swarm and you average those and you come out with a thing that's sitting maybe 33 days recovery period for five of the species that you're wanting. Not the ones you plan for. The ones you plan for probably need a longer recovery period than what you're working with here. Here you're working with a recovery period less because your soil has been messed up. You stress the plants, they're going to push up seed quicker. But by the time on a 30 day or 34 day recovery period you're in your third graze, this soil has already improved and this can then go up towards 40, 42, 45, etc. In drier areas, I say for every week it hasn't rained, add a day to your recovery period. And if it's a very brittle area, like 10 inches a year, I will say for every week it doesn't rain, add two days to your recovery period. And they find they get pretty accurate. Just start somewhere. It's a learning curve for you, and it gives you practice to start looking at your plants. But you don't have to learn the name of the plants. It's the best. Well, what do the cattle eat? Watch the cattle. Okay. So you work with that, and it gives you a starting point. You fine-tune it, and you fire the bank manager. And when you've got it all down packed, let's go down the pub and wait for somebody to come down and buy you seven beers. beers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank the average condition of animals through the years because it's accumulative and that then makes it a lot easier because you can have a, a mistake and it's not going to make any difference to your bank balance. <laughs>